Hello, and uh, I want to thank you for coming to my talk today, Surprise Inspiring Resilience. I don't want to yell surprise too loudly at the beginning of a talk. That seems like a bad idea. So instead, I'll just say so quietly, surprise. I want to tell you a little story today. And this story doesn't require you to know anything about race cars or even like race cars. But I'm pretty sure at the end, we can all sort of relate to the story in question. So on July 12th of 2020, during the opening weekend of the Formula 2 racing season, so many of you have probably heard of Formula 1. Formula 2 is sort of the next rung down. It's where you uh, get ready to go into Formula 1 if you're lucky. Uh, there's a fellow named Mick Schumacher. That name may sound familiar to you based on his father, Michael Schumacher. But Mick Schumacher, his son, is a race car driver. And he was in third place, cruising through the Styrian Grand Prix on the way to a podium, to a podium finish, which is what you call it when you're in first, second, or third. And during the race, as he's doing this, a little piece of rubber pops off of his tire, comes into the cockpit of his car, and hits the button on his steering wheel that deploys the fire extinguisher. Now, what you see here is a tweet from Mick Schumacher's uh, Twitter account. And down toward the bottom, you can sort of see uh, some spray, some fire extinguisher stuff, you know, around the inside of his cockpit. Now, I, he did have to retire the car, but he made it off the track and into the pits with no damage, uh, other than the fire extinguisher, of course. His later tweets describe this as a once in every 10 years event, as you can see here. Uh, now, cars in Formula 2 cost about 500000 ish dollars, and they're doing sometimes close to 200 miles an hour. And they're, they're crammed into this tiny little cockpit where they have so little room. Their, their knees are braced up into the front. Uh, they even have to wear pads sometimes on their knees because they rattle around in there. And, and I don't know about you, but if I were just walking or hanging out in my house or just doing anything, even trivial things, and a fire extinguisher went off, I would probably at least fall down, if not completely freak out. And it just sort of blows my mind that Mick Schumacher whizzing around a track at hundreds of miles an hour, making all these abrupt, crazy decisions, pulling lots of Gs, was able to pull this off, was able to bring the car back safely. Now, at the time of this accident, or it wasn't even really an accident, at the time of this occurrence, this near miss maybe, uh, Mick Schumacher had been racing cars for about 12 years, and he relied on his extensive skills and experience to get this done. He, he was prepared for an event that, frankly, nobody would have bothered to write a rule book for or a run book or maybe have practiced or anything to that effect. He, his skill, his capabilities helped avoid a loss of control, uh, a significant financial loss, possibly even injury or, you know, otherwise really significant damage. And this is pretty impressive. So w when I saw this happen, I was impressed like, wow, this, this is in a completely different industry than tech, but there are some really strong parallels. And what can we learn if we look outside of our industry, the sort of norms, the things that we think about every day, and we look to other industries or other situations for how they think about resilience. So you may be wondering who in the world is this guy and why should I listen to anything that he says? Well, I am Corey Watson. I'm both uh, the picture uh, on the screen and also the moving person down uh, at the bottom. And I work for a company called Jelly, that's jelly.io. And we do uh, incident review software. We help you learn from incidents. And, and, and not just incidents, but also maybe even your successes, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, I've done reliability and resilience work and observability work for companies like Stripe and Splunk and Twitter. And I've broken a whole lot of stuff in my career. Uh, some of it I even uh, fixed, but uh, I, sometimes I even did that on purpose. But I, I, I joke about this because at the end of the day, like we are the things that make these systems work. And quite often the work that we do stabilizes or keeps the system going. But in many of these contexts, like this talk or these conferences or whatnot, we, we have a tendency to focus on the things that we break. And I think that's unfortunate because I think more often than not, we're fixing things instead of just breaking them. But anyway, enough about me. Let's talk some more about resilience. So resilience is this, this ability to not fall apart whenever something bad happens, to persevere through, through problems or, or bad circumstances or you know, whatever you want to call them. And the problem with resilience is we tend to want it right now. We tend to want it during an incident, during the incident that we just had or we're currently experiencing, right? We tend to say that, ah, we need this now or whatever. It's the most sort of pointed and sharp and painful part of the, of the time in which we're dealing with resilience. We want it right this second. We tend to want it too late. And I'm using fire extinguisher emojis, harking back to, to Mick Schumacher, who is going to make a return a little bit later in this talk. 
Now, we could talk a lot about the, the literature. I love to read the literature. Some of my favorite afternoons are just curling up with a good paper and a set of highlighters and marking my way through with a cup of tea, all the interesting things that we're going to learn. But in this case, we're talking about David Wood's paper called Resilience is a Verb. And I'm not going to make you read the whole paper. I'm instead going to pull out one particular quote that's really important to me and is sort of the basis for a lot of this talk today. The ability to recognize and to stretch, extend, or, or change what you're doing, what you have planned, right, has to be there in advance of adapting. So the emphasis is mine here where I've, where I've emboldened it. Has to be there in advance is the important thing. If we want resilience, if we want to deal well with failure like Mick Schumacher did, we have to put a plan in place. We have to do something. That's why resilience is a verb. We need to prepare. We need to do. We can't just hope. Uh, some of our colleagues in security, I think a long time ago, said hope is not a strategy. I'm not, I'm not sure if that's just a security saying. I've associated it with it. But it isn't a strategy. We must prepare. It must be there in advance of adapting. And so a lot of the things that we do for incidents, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but I do want to pay a little bit of attention to the concept called barriers. So barriers are about stopping people from making a mistake. So sometimes that's to put a, a guardrail around a dangerous curve or to put uh, you know, something, something in your CICD pipeline that won't allow a build to go into production unless a certain test passes. And so this is a focus on prevention, on stopping something from happening. This is not the same thing as resilience, but it's where we spend a lot of our time. A lot of incident uh, sort of post-mortem material is about creating uh, these action items for things to do to stop this from happening in the future, right? So uh, another bit of literature, Accidents and Barriers, by uh, Holnagel in 99. Uh, again, I'm just going to pull out the important thing, which is that barriers can be used as a means to prevent a same or a similar accident. Again, emphasis mine. So same or similar accident. If we had a situation where something went into production where a specific test that was meant to stop, say, a certain type of user input from coming in that would break the application, and that test failed, but it went into production anyway, you can imagine that would have a negative impact on the user. But many times, the most sort of persnickety tests for us are maybe those involving timing or some sort of random thing. And then suddenly we're now hung up getting a deploy into production that's got an important bug fix in it because this stupid flaky test won't pass. And this is important for us to make a distinction. Barriers are not the same thing as resilience. To stop someone from sort of doing something that we think they're not supposed to do only really stops us from the same or similar accident happening, right? So if, we, if we're just trying to prevent that one thing, it may work, but the implications are larger. And so that's why we're talking about resilience, not just barriers. Barriers are sort of different thing, and they have their place, and they're important, as Holnagel said, to prevent same or similar accidents. So a little more literature. I'm going to keep doing this. All good talks are going to come with a lot of literature like this. Let's talk a little bit about complex systems. And if you've never been to how.complexsystems.fail, I highly encourage you to do so after this talk. Pay attention to me for now. Uh, but complex systems are these big masses of technical and social components that we sort of smoosh together to become an application or a web property or even a company or an organization, just a group of people. And the important thing that I want to pull out of this piece of material, this, this literature uh, from, from Dr. Cook, is failure-free operations require experience with failure. This is another important thing, right? If we put all those barriers up to stop people from ever failing, when things inevitably do fail, we're not going to be prepared. Imagine if Mick Schumacher had never had a situation where the car didn't do what he wanted or was under duress somehow. He was never going to be able to have the capacity to deal with that car when a fire extinguisher went off. You have to experience failure to have failure-free operations. Kind of counterintuitive, but really important. All right, experience with failure. So we have to have this, uh, to not have failure. Okay, so what, what are we doing with our failures to breed these improvements or our successes? If we have to have experience with failure, we do learn individually, but what's incumbent upon us is the people who care about this sort of thing in organizations is to figure out how do we, from the failure or the success that we, that we experience, how do we gain and learn as an organization? How do we verb our resilience? How do we do resilience? How do we prepare? So if you look at back into that resilience as a verb paper, 
Um, so whole, I think, I think Wood cites Holnagel in this, which is why both of their names are here. But the, the goal, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on a text-heavy slide, but the goal here is to anticipate, to see signs of trouble, to, to synchronize, to help different levels keep track of change. These are the attributes that we need to, to be prepared. So we need to be ready to respond. Obviously, who doesn't have an on-call rotation for an adequately complex or important product? And lastly, we need to proactively learn. We need to be watching for brittleness, for opportunity, for weak signals, for symptoms, for things that, you know, sort of like uh, smell like near misses. Uh, that's, another, that's another good name for these. We need to be doing all of these things. And we're going to talk a little bit about these later. Uh, and, I'm, and in the middle, I'm going to try to provide you with some examples. So what are you doing in your organization to foster these types of attributes, right? If we go back to these attributes, anticipation, synchronization, the readiness to respond, proactively learning, what are we doing to foster these? And that's why we want to go through some examples from outside of the tech industry to sort of think a bit outside of the box, to look for something different, to be inspired to, to see how resilience is being done in these other places and maybe use that lens to look back at our own work in a slightly different way. We want to think specifically outside the industry, again, to sort of get that brain turning on something different, something that isn't just the way that you've approached CICD or, you know, yes, no prompts or, you know, showing the diff before the deploy, anything like that. Like we want to see something completely different. And that's what I hope to do today. So the first example that I want to give is from the U.S. Navy. So there's something in the Navy called the Plane Guard. And you can check this out on Wikipedia. There's a whole entry for it down in the bottom right. A ship or a helicopter at all times during aircraft recovery operations. So when a, a, a naval aircraft is landing on the deck of an aircraft carrier, there is a ship or a helicopter tasked with the recovery of those air crews. So this is a really dangerous thing. It's often described as sort of one of the most dangerous jobs in the world to try to land an airplane on the deck of a pitching, rolling aircraft carrier. And so that sort of fear that would be reasonable in any human that's trying to do this can be assuaged by having someone nearby to rescue you. And so not just in the U.S. Navy, but in many different navies over many different years, this plane guard idea has been in effect. And so the idea is that there is a helicopter hovering, already ready to go, off the backside of the ship, waiting for the opportunity that if an air crew has to ditch, has to sort of pull the evacuation, or sorry, the eject handle and pop out of the plane, that they are going to be there to swoop in quickly to rescue that crew. And this is a dedicated expense. Like it takes a lot of time, money, training, resources, and what have you to put this crew in a helicopter or an entire ship dedicated to hanging out off the back of the boat waiting for someone to maybe have an accident. And if we look down at the bottom left here, I'm, par I'm partly covering this with my video, but from the U.S. Navy, we can see the number of manned Class A flight mishaps in the Navy. I couldn't find good numbers on just aircraft carrier failures, but they have, per 100,000 flight hours, just a few, just four Class A mishaps in 2020. Now, a Class A mishap is considered to be over a certain number of millions of dollars of damage or the loss of an airframe or something to that effect. And that's really interesting to me because just despite having only four incidents per 100,000 flight hours, they still dedicate the time, the material, and the attention to the plane guard, which is pretty interesting. And it makes me think about what we do to sort of be prepared to provide a backstop or safety for the people who are doing dangerous operations in our own organizations. All right, everybody loves, I'm actually wearing a NASA shirt today, everybody loves uh, some good space talk, especially in our nerdy industry. Well, the countdown hold comes from, uh, this is from the space shuttle. I, I didn't research into whether or not they still do this today, but the space shuttle had something built into it called a countdown hold, which was a pause in the countdown. So everybody knows the, the, the countdown scenario, the T minus so many minutes or hours or what have you. And these holds are built into the countdown to allow the launch team to still target you know, a particular launch window, an area of time when the launch makes sense based on the position of the Earth and you know, the weather and all these other things, and to provide a cushion of time for certain tasks, I'm just reading here literally, and, and procedures without impacting the overall schedule. So the Space Shuttle Countdown has a bunch of these holds built into it. I'm just going to use one example, which is down toward the bottom of this screenshot, which is that T minus 27 hours, then the first built-in hold of four hours 
takes effect. And in this window, something very critical happens. We have to clear the launch pad of all non-essential personnel. Now, this hold means that the countdown is stopped. And the amount of time necessary for the, uh, for the procedure to take place, to clear people, can be arbitrary. We can take as much time as is necessary. Sometimes maybe that's really easy. Other times, maybe someone's unaccounted for. And you can imagine in a, in a safety conscious or in a very risky operation, someone not being around is really terrifying. And so knowing that you have the capability to hold and say, you know what, we're going to take 30 more minutes to try to find this person who's not on our list. They're probably just in the break room having a Fanta, you know, or something like that. But we're still going to take the extra time and not just assume that success is in place. And I think that's really interesting because they built in the opportunity here for safety. This is a situation where even though something is big at risk, billions of dollars sometimes have been invested. That's all the more reason to take a little extra time for safety and make sure that we've built that into the process and the procedure for how we do our work. So that's a very cool thing from NASA. Olympic planning. This is relevant. Uh, the Olympics having recently just happened. Uh, the Olympic planning committee has something called the host city contract, which is this big, huge PDF, which is linked down at the bottom right. You can go check it out yourself. That basically tells people how to go and, and, and sort of put on an Olympics. These are the requirements that they have to have. Now, a lot of the examples that I'm giving you here, including this big document full of literal rules for how to do a job, you'll notice are already in place. It's a little bit different than the idea of resilience, which is sort of how did we decide to put these together? So somebody in the Olympic Planning Committee figured out at some Olympics over the years that it's a good idea to have full power redundancy from geographically independent substations. We can all relate to that, those of us who have worked in data centers and stuff, right? It's probably a good idea, probably a good idea that was born from experience. So what's neat to me about this process, these are neat just because they're neat, but also how did we get here? What sort of situation brought us to documenting these? How did these get documented? Who decided it was a good idea to review them? And sort of what's the operational setup that gets us this document in the end? What yields this? So another neat one uh, is the NRG07. You may not exceed 80% of capacity of your electrical generation. That's, that's pretty cool too, right? Pretty smart. And then my favorite one was NRG08, which says, ensure that the field of play lighting is powered from two independent sources, each supplying 50% of lighting. So in the event that the lights go out at one geographic location, or sorry, that the power goes out and therefore the lights, then we still got 50% of the lights, which we assume means that if it's dark, that we're still going to be able to have the event, whatever it is, indoor, outdoor, you know, swimming, soccer, whatever that is. So this is really interesting. Like someone is taking the time to regularly and reliably draw together these rules. I don't know how fixed they are. I don't know how often they're reviewed by the Olympic Committee, but that would be a very interesting thing to understand because their resilience comes from their investment in this contract, which is pretty cool. All right, Notre Dame, uh, the Paris, uh, Notre Dame de Paris, uh, the fire that we had there. This is actually the, the, the thing that I read that caused the idea for this talk. When I read this, I was fascinated. So Notre Dame, I think everyone's familiar with the fire that happened years back uh, in this old, old, old church that contains some very priceless uh, artifacts. And so this is a quote from an article in Science that I read that actually uh, triggered me making this talk, as I said before, following a protocol developed for just such a disaster, that's the important part of this, we're going to come back to it, firefighters knew which works of art to rescue and in which order. So they knew to keep the water pressure low, right? Because if they sprayed that on the stained glass windows, the cold water would shatter the hot glass. And this, this blew my mind. Like, who thinks that this priceless place is going to burn? And who takes the time to one day say, you know what, I think I'm going to saunter over to the local fire department, you know, maybe take some coffee or some treats over and say, hey, let's put a plan together in the event that Notre Dame has a big fire. What, 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 what works of art? There were some other uh, mentions in this article that there were works of art that were listed out in sort of a priority order to help the firefighters know what to rescue, what to retrieve from Notre Dame. And this is, this is impressive to me. It isn't that the resilience came from them preemptively having the conversation, them doing the planning, them putting the plan in place. I don't know how often they tested the plan. That's another great question. Uh, but in this case, it was successful. They were able to salvage many parts of what was inside of Notre Dame, uh, the windows, all that other sort of stuff, because they thought about it ahead of time. And they took the time to verb their resilience by making a plan and putting a plan in place, and it paid off in the situation, which is pretty great. Uh, 
So we, I opened with race cars. I'm going to have to talk about cars some more. So the Remots Nevera, which used to be called the C2, is a $2.4 million electric hypercar. But this bad boy still gets crash tested. That blew my mind. Like, how in the world do you take a such a hugely expensive car, which sometimes there are very few of them because it's a concept car, it's a work, it's a work in progress, and crash it? And what's interesting to me is doing some investigation, you can see the bottom right, there's a link to a YouTube video that these cars actually are more expensive in their non-production form because they're one-offs. They contain very specific handmade sometimes parts that there are no duplicates for. And so they, they still crash test them even though they are this expensive. Now, th there is lots of simulation here done ahead of time, computer simulation. Uh, sometimes they will test very specific parts to make sure that they're successful. Sometimes just parts of the car hit in certain ways. Sometimes they can crash test one part of the car and then crash test a different part later because they don't affect each other. But at the end of the day, they're still going to crash test multiple full cars, as you can see at the bottom right, where they destroyed one. And this is fascinating to me because even though we, we've advanced simulations so far, we have, you know, decades of car building experience built up that we can rely on, we still throw them against something hard and fast to see what happens whenever we do it. So even though we think we know how this works, we still have to test it on a regular basis. Next up, TWA Flight 800. So this was a tragedy in July of 1996 when 12 minutes after takeoff, uh, 230 people perished due to this plane uh, crashing. Now, what was interesting to me about this was that the, the NTSB, National Transportation Safety Board, actually saved the wreckage of the plane after the investigation was over for 25 years. It was just this year that they decided to finally dispose of the wreckage. They used that wreckage, though, to train 25 years' worth of NTSB investigators to investigate air, airplane crashes. Blows my mind. They had this thought to save this plane for 25 years. The, the sort of, we, we took this, this tragedy, this really, really bad thing, and we turned it into an opportunity for us all to learn and for us to advance the state of the industry. And in fact, they're even keeping this wreckage, but they're doing so digitally. They're laser scanning it all in so that it can be still taught to NTSB investigators going forward. So it's even going to continue to pay off in the future. And so this is a really fascinating way to take something that was a big problem, a big mistake in the industry, and to bring that forward and help improve the industry for the future. Uh, another example that's really important lately is the rationing of healthcare. So this is not new to the COVID era. Uh, market forces, other things have always made the rationing of healthcare important, but it has huge ethical and financial questions. This was done in the 40s for iron lungs with polio, in the 60s with dialysis machines, and then now in the modern era with ventilators, ICU beds, etc. So this rationing of healthcare, there's tons of investors, papers written about this to understand how it works and what's going on. Because even when we are not, uh, you know, a few years back in an era where this was really, really important thing to discuss, there are always going to be small scale situations, maybe a very localized uh, large failure disaster where people are hurt or a nationwide or even worldwide pandemic. And so this sort of investment before the problem is happening is, again, really valuable. What drives us? What motivates us? Who chooses to investigate in this even when they are not currently in a situation where rationing is necessary? So coming back to resilience, when do we want it? Well, we always want it when we need it, and we don't think as much about it beforehand. So how are you working in advance? Where are your verbs? Where are you verbing resilience in your organization? What are you doing to bring that forward? What fostered these practices at these organizations? I've hinted at this a few times. The fact that the NTSB did save the wreckage of TWA Flight 800, now it's already been verbed. It's a noun. The wreckage is physically in a place and people are being trained. But what brought them to make that decision? Uh, Remats is required to crash Nevera's uh, that's part of part of homologation of bringing cars to to multiple countries and and places. But the plane guard of the U.S. Navy, like they very rarely have crashes. Why are they still investing in this? Uh, who in the Notre Dame uh, administration decided it was worth investing in this up front? Maybe it's easy to think of that for Notre Dame because it's such an expensive, such a priceless, such an irreplaceable thing. But many of the things that we operate are also dangerous and expensive. Uh, what 
sort of built this process into the uh, the space shuttle launch, this countdown hold, this idea that we should create these flexible, these flexi spots where we can bend the process to accommodate weird things that might come up in safety critical time frames. What caused these to show up in organizations? How did we choose to invest in them? We often, you know, in this industry, we often write blog posts about cool stuff our companies do or whatever. What makes us do those? When do we turn that corner? When do we do that investment? That moment when we verb is what's powerful. So how can we be more like Mick? How can we be prepared? How do we make this less of a big deal when we need to improve? We don't want to just think about failure whenever the fire extinguisher blows up in the cockpit. We want to think about it beforehand. So again, resilience is a verb. We need to anticipate. We need to synchronize. We need to be ready to respond. We need to proactively learn. How do we do some of those things? What can you do to foster some of these things inside your organization? This is what I want you thinking. With this new sort of view of the world where a lot of other people are doing this in other industries. Well, to anticipate, we already said REMATS needs to spend, to, st to still crash these $2 million hypercars. We have to plan ahead of time. If we know something could happen, why don't we think about that? Why don't we plan it out and test it a little earlier? We could be chaos engineering. That's sort of what crash testing is. We're going to do it because we know it is probably going to happen. We could also be sure that we are talking to users and talking to customers, listening to their perceptions of what's going on, what's important, what's dangerous, and what might happen. And we also need to be listening for weak signals, for near misses. We need to say, okay, well, what? Okay, so that incident was interesting, but what could have happened? You know, when you're in an incident and people are like, well, we're lucky that the, the, the blue didn't blar. Well, that's really interesting because you can anticipate that and fold it into your thought process. What if it did happen? And what should we do as a result? So we need to synchronize, not just ourselves with this anticipation, but when we know some stuff's going to happen, we need to synchronize with other levels, with leadership, with the teams that depend on us and the teams that we depend on, with customer support, with the customers in question. So we need to sometimes just sit in on each other's stuff, to hang out, to talk. The more cross-pollination you can do, the more sort of interaction with other teams, the more likely that you're going to know stuff when you need to, or that you can sort of brew up a plan together. We also need to share our focus, our information, and our goals. If your company's shipping 19 different things in 19 different places, it's reasonable that no one team or, or, or focus is going to maybe get all the attention that it deserves. This doesn't mean that we can't do 19 things. It just needs, means we need to find a way to fold them together and make sure that we're not too distracted. We need to also seek reciprocity. We need to find places where we can help teams and they can reciprocate and help us. That's one of the most core parts of resilience is that we help each other when something goes wrong. The fire department usually sits around waiting, right? But sometimes passers-by in, in, uh, in, in dangerous situations, in accidents, pitch in. You know, I'm sure sometimes you've, you've seen a car accident and maybe pulled over and helped out. Maybe it wasn't something that you needed to do at the time. Maybe it was a false alarm, but that's okay because you were there to help. And lastly, if you know certain things are coming, deadlines, features, holidays, communicate about these early and often. Make sure people know they're coming. Make sure that we're planning so we can build in those flexible spots like NASA does. Ready response. If you are going to protect air crews, if you're going to have someone crash, you need to be ready. You need to have pre-positioned material, equipment, and resources. What do you have ready? You've probably got an on-call rotation. Is the on-call rotation healthy? Are you taking the time to train the people the right way? Do you, during business hours, have people ready to go, right? Do we practice? You know, there's always this old joke that backups are useless if you don't try to use them. Any pre-positioned equipment or resource that you're going to use to deal with resilience, you have to have it practiced. It has to, you have to know it works. Uh, and you have to have to methods for collecting information when these things happen. Sometimes the response doesn't need to be deploying a person to fix it. Sometimes it needs to be deploying the material to gather data so afterward you can learn. We'll talk about that in a moment. And lastly, we need to dedicate time, training, and resources to this. People need to know how to do these things. It's not enough to just say, oh, well, we're, we're, we have some people on call, but are they experienced and trained and ready? Have they experienced failure so that they can know how to deal with it? And lastly, we need to proactively learn. The NTSB saw an opportunity for learning with TWA Flight 800 and they invested in it. We need to be deliberate about how we choose to learn. We need to analyze not just our failures, but also our successes, because that's where a lot of our weak signals and, well, we're real lucky this didn't happen situations come from. We need to educate and share this with other people. 
And lastly, we need to sort of seek connection and context here. How do we sort of bring this to bear with another team so that we find common ground and we work together on things? We can't just work on this in our own parts of the organization, again, synchronizing. I find it interesting that all of these to me are very connected. Like you're not just proactively learning, you're also synchronizing and stuff as you learn. So if we do this sort of thing, back to Mr. Schumacher, if we do this sort of thing, if we invest, if we pre-position, if we, if we spend 12 years being race car drivers so that we're prepared, we may succeed just like Mick Schumacher did. He didn't win the race in question that I brought up earlier, but he did go on to win the Formula 2 championship that year. Uh, he didn't do it from winning a whole lot of races. He, he actually only won two, and he didn't even qualify in pole position, which is sort of the, the fastest person who's going to start the race in first place. He didn't even do that. Not a single time. Um, he won through consistency, preparation, and, and a pretty good bit of luck. In short, he was resilient. He was prepared. He was ready. And he now has a seat in Formula One where he drives for the Haas racing team, which is, if you're into Formula One, you know they're, they're not very good. But still, he's at the pinnacle of motorsport. I hope that you can get to the pinnacle of your industry as well through investing in this. I hope that you'll use this as inspiration to look outside of the industry, uh, of your own sort of context and bubble. And uh, at the end of the day, we're the ones who make resilience. And I really appreciate you attending this talk today. Thanks so much.